Part 27. The Dance of Fate. Irvine, 10.09pm. Sarah was watching the pavement rush by, lit by the headlights. Beyond, there was darkness, swallowing the horizon. She was thinking that the future, always so clear to her, had become like a black highway at night. They were in uncharted territory now, making up history as they went along. She felt for the first time that she had taken fate's hand and was now leading the dance. What they did next would either change the future or destroy it. She looked up as a vast rectangle of light loomed ahead. The Cyberdyne building. Dyson zipped his security guard through the ID scanner slot in one motion. There was the sound of a servo lock clacking open and he entered the spacious lobby followed by Sarah, John and the Terminator, who was wearing his bullet-riddled jacket and a black glove over the exposed endoskeleton arm. The guard at the front desk was a calm, relaxed man named Gibbons. He was reading Westways magazine and actually enjoying the article on yucca trees and their origin, when he looked up to see Miles Dyson moving towards him, pale and sweaty, but smiling warmly speaking well before he reached the desk. <clears throat> Evening, Paul. Uh, these are friends of mine from out of town. I just thought I'd take them up and show them around. I'm sorry, Mr. Dyson. You know the rules about visitors in the lab. I need written authorized Kachak. Gibbons was staring down the barrels of Sarah's and the Terminator's weapons. The Terminator said, I insist. Gibbons was too stunned to move. His eyes went to the silent alarm button on the console, but Sarah, following his eyes, said, Don't even think about it. Gibbons nodded, remaining as still as his hammering heart would allow. The Terminator circled quickly and pulled the guard out of the chair. John pulled a roll of duct tape from his knapsack and tore off a piece. A few minutes later, the second floor elevator doors opened and the Terminator led the group warily into the corridor. They had a cart piled high with gear in nylon bags. Dyson motioned down the corridor to the right. As they walked, he continued to fill them in. The vault needs two keys to open, mine and one from the security station. They stood in front of a wide security door, a sign above read, Special Projects Division, Authorised Personnel Only. Dyson zipped his keycard through the scanner and the door unlatched. A roving guard named Moshier strolled down the long corridor from the first floor office block. A punch clock swung at his hip and he'd just completed his circuit of the building. He passed the bank of elevators and rounded the corner to the front desk, calling out, Honey, I'm home. Moshir saw the desk was deserted and frowned. <sighs> Gibbons must be in the can, so check that first before getting alarmed. Sighing, he walked to the restroom around the corner. As he pushed through the door, he said, Hey man, you shouldn't leave the... Gibbons was handcuffed to the urinal trying to mumble something through the gaffer's tape over his mouth. Moshia spun on a dime and sprinted to the desk where he slapped his hand down on the silent alarm button. At the security station, Dyson's hand swished his ID card repeatedly through the scanner slot on the locker. Nothing was happening. The light on the locker was blinking red. Sarah anxiously turned to Dyson. What? What is it? Dyson motioned towards a light flashing on the console, then said, Silent alarm's been tripped. It neutralizes the codes throughout the building. Nothing will open now. Dyson took that in, and his nerves snapped. We should have bought. Sarah grabbed his collar. No! We're going all the way. You got that, Dyson? He saw the fire in her eyes and thought of his work burning in his backyard. She was right. There was no turning back now. 
Moshir had gotten Gibbons loose, and now the guard was hanging over the desk phone, talking to the local police. Multiple armed suspects. Look, I, I think it's that guy from the mall shootout. And the woman. Yeah, her. I'm pretty sure. Just send everything you've got in the area. On the second floor, John jumped on a desk next to the ball-mounted locker. Dyson stared in amazement as John started pulling out his counter-electronics gear out of his knapsack. It was just another fed teller to him. You guys get started on the lab. I can open this. Dyson led the Terminator and Sarah to the main lab doors. Another servo lock. He tried his card. Nothing. The Terminator stepped in and said, Let me try mine. He unslung the M79 grenade launcher, pulling it over his shoulder in one motion. Sarah grabbed Dyson and dragged him back down the hall. The Terminator opened the breach and slid in one of the fat 40mm HE grenades. He flipped the thing closed with a snap of the wrist. Sarah yelled as they ran, John, fire in the hole! John dropped what he was doing and covered his ears. The Terminator fired at inhumanly close range. The door exploded into kindling. The concussion blew his jacket open and flying shrapnel whizzed all around him. Before the thunderclap had faded, the Terminator was walking into the fire and smoke. John went back to work without missing a beat. Sarah and a stunned Dyson stepped through the burning doorframe into the artificial intelligence lab. A baleful siren began wailing. The Halon fire control system had been triggered. The invisible gas roared in, snuffing out the flames. Dyson yelled, Fire set off the Halon system! Here! Hurry! He ran to a wall cabinet and pulled out some breathing masks. He handed one to Sarah and donned the other. Then he reached out to hand one to the Terminator. Here! No, thank you, the big cyborg said as he removed his massive backpack and opened it. The Terminator didn't need a mask, as his oxygen requirements were so low. Dyson shrugged and tossed the mask on a desk, turning to Sarah. We'll have to keep these on a couple of minutes till the gas clears. As planned, the Terminator strolled down the hall and pulled three five-gallon drums of solvent from a storage room. Sarah started pulling out book-sized olive drab claymore mines, taping them to the top of the drums. Dyson stared. Part of him couldn't believe they were really doing this. This morning, he'd been on the verge of a breakthrough that would have made him a rich man for the rest of his life. Now, he was in the middle of a war to destroy that breakthrough, and considering what they were saving, it was exhilarating. Across town, the T-1000 moved slowly through Dyson's ravaged study, analysing what had happened there. He walked down the dark hallway. The place was deserted. The flames from the backyard bonfire were smoldering. The T-1000 stood in the dying glow, processing. He had arrived at Salceda's camp minutes after they had pulled out. Switching to its secondary strategy, the T-1000 ran through its files until it came up with Miles Dyson. Using the police walkie from the bike, it had located its next destination. Here. The police walkie now clipped on his belt blared to life. All units, all units. 211 in progress at the Cyberdyne building. Multiple armed suspects. SWAT unit is en route. The T-1000 sprinted out of the house and threw his leg over the Kawasaki. Fired it up. The tyres laid a scorch mark on the pavement as it spun around and roared away. On the second floor of the Cyberdyne building, a fire axe smashed down through the housing of a large, state-of-the-art disk drive, shattering it. The entire room was a scene of high-tech pillage. The Terminator beat the disk drive into junk and stepped to another. Wham! 
Same routine. He'd already demolished half a dozen. Sarah toppled a file cabinet, scattering the files. Dyson staggered up with an armload of heavy MO, magnetic optical, discs, and dropped them on a growing stack in the middle of the floor. He and Sarah had their breathing masks hanging down around their necks, as the halon gas had by now dissipated. Dyson turned to Sarah, panting. Yeah, all that stuff, and all the discs in those offices, especially my office. Everything in my office. Sarah went into Dyson's office and started hurling everything out the door onto the central junk pile. Books, files, everything on the desk. A framed photo of Dyson's wife and kids landed on top of the heap. Teresa hugging Danny and Blythe, all grinning. The glass was shattered. The Terminator was cutting a swathe under Dyson's direction, exploding equipment into fragments with his inhuman swings. These two, this is important. It was carnage. Millions in hardware and all the irreplaceable fruits of years of research. Shattered, broken, dumped in a heap for the big bonfire of destiny. Dyson stopped a second, panting. Give me that thing a second. The Terminator handed him the axe. Dyson hefted it one-handed. He turned to a lab table. On it was another prototype processor. I've worked for years on this stuff. Swinging awkwardly, but with great force, he smashed the axe down onto the processor prototype, exploding it into fragments. His shoulder was in agony, but he looked satisfied. In the security station, John tapped away at his little laptop, which was running code combinations into the keycard lock. Suddenly, the green light on the locker went on, and it unlocked with a clunk. Easy money. He whipped it open, revealing a rack of keys, but the vault key was distinctive, a long steel rectangle on a neck chain. John grabbed it and started to run towards the lab. He was stopped by a bright light blasting through the window. The thump of rotors announced the arrival of a police chopper that hovered in close to the building, raking its xenon spotlight through the second floor offices. John whirled to the bank of video security monitors nearby and saw various angles on the front parking lot. Headlights swarmed. LAPD black and whites poured into the lot, turning the area into a disco of whirling blue and red lights. Sarah and the Terminator were working like a crack team, rigging the explosives. She finished taping the claymores to the drums, turning them into powerful incendiary bombs. The Terminator was attaching claymores and blocks of sea plastic explosive to the large mainframe computer cabinets nearby. All the claymores were wired back to one detonator that had a radio control relay switch. How do you set them off? Dyson asked. The Terminator showed him the remote detonator, a small transmitter with a red plunger. Radio remote. He made a plunger pushing motion with his thumb and an accompanying click sound. Dyson nodded gravely. John came running in, holding up the key. I got it! Piece of cake! And we got company. The police? Dyson asked anxiously. John nodded. Sarah turned to the windows. How many? John shrugged. All of them? Sarah turned to Dyson. Go, I'll finish here. The Terminator hefted the minigun and the ammo backpack. I'll take care of the police. John anxiously turned to the cyborg. You sure you won't kill anyone? The Terminator said, Trust me. Then he smiled. This time he got it right. Moshier and Gibbons were carrying out the company mandate to provide absolute security for the building by cowering behind police cars in the parking lot in front of the building. More police were arriving by the second.
On the second story, John and Dyson dashed through the security station, heading for the vault. The Terminator crossed the office towards the floor-to-ceiling windows. He was outlined starkly by the chopper's spotlight as it slashed through the dark offices. Without breaking stride, he kicked an executive desk towards the window. Glass exploded outwards and the desk toppled, falling to the sidewalk below. The Terminator, standing at the edge, fired a long burst, which strafed the police cars lined up below. Cops ducked as front windshields shattered. The Terminator, with his superb aim, hit no one. But notice was served. The cops, of course, seeking to validate their existence as well as preserve it, fired back. The Terminator calmly re-aimed and plotted a firing pattern that crisscrossed the parking lot. He pulled the trigger on the GE minigun and held it down. 4,000 7.62mm rounds clattered down to their targets. In 15 seconds, every single police car had been riddled and reduced to wreckage. Not one policeman had been hit. The ones who hadn't already fled looked down at their woefully inadequate weapons and ran off. A few extremely brave souls fired again. The Terminator leveled the M79 and fired. The grenades blasted several police cars into the sky. They fell back, erupting into flame. A moment later, the police fell back, regrouping. A SWAT van careened around a corner and skidded to a stop just out of range. In the vault antechamber, John and Dyson stood poised, hands on keys. The boy said, And let's see what's behind door number one. Dyson nodded, and they turned the keys together. The vault grumbled to itself, withdrawing its locking bolts with a final clonk. Together, Dyson and John swung the huge door open. In the lobby, the varsity took the field as the SWAT troopers sprinted forward by squads. They flanked the lobby and worked their way inside, deploying rapidly, moving and freezing behind cover, quivering with adrenaline. They had body armour, gas masks, Heckler & Koch MP5 assault rifles, tear gas launchers, ropes. Can't do the job right without the right tools. They made a lot of hand signals and kept their mouths shut. The Roman generals would have been proud. Outside, the police began firing tear gas grenades through the broken windows into the second floor offices. In the vault, John and Dyson were isolated from the world in the silent steel womb. Dyson opened the cabinet containing the Terminator relics. John stared with uneasy deja vu as he saw the Terminator hand and CPU. Then, in one vicious move, he swept his arm behind the inert gas flasks and hurled them to the floor. They shattered. John snatched the CPU and the metal hand out of the broken glass. Got old Skynet by the balls now, Miles. Come on, let's book. Clutching the steel hand and pocketing the chip like it was a Mars bar he'd just bought, John ran out. Dyson followed. On the first floor, the advanced squad of SWATs made it to one of the stairwells. They started up, two at a time, covering each other ritualistically by the numbers. John pelted into the lab with Dyson stumbling along behind him. Sarah had just finished wiring all the charges to the central detonator. Ready to rock? Ready. John tossed her the metal hand. She caught it and bent to put it in her empty backpack. Sarah zipped the pack and started to shuck into it. Dyson stood in the middle of the lab, saying goodbye to it in his mind. He was running out of steam. The bandages at his shoulder were soaked with seeping blood. The Terminator strode into the lab behind him. Time to go, right now. He and John headed back the way they'd come, through the security station. Sarah finished her work and turned to the detonator. 20 feet away, near where Dyson was standing. Miles, hand me the detonator. Let's go. He gingerly picked up the detonator, started towards her, then 
Crash. The doors at the back of the lab were kicked open. The SWAT leader and two others opened fire. Their rifles raked the room. Sarah dove behind a computer cabinet. Dyson was hit several times, slammed to the floor by the impacts. In the hall, John heard the firing and spun to run back. Mom! The Terminator grabbed him as bullets blasted into his broad back. He lunged around the corner with John, out of the line of fire. In the lab, bullets raked over Sarah's head, smacking all around her, clanging into the machine protecting her as the SWAT team poured on the fire. She saw Dyson slumped on the floor. The detonator was clutched in his hand. He rolled to face her, his eyes bulging from the pain of his torn up guts. Go, he whispered. Sarah hesitated a split second, her eyes meeting his, then snap rolled and fast crawled through the broken glass and debris into the nearest doorway. Big mistake. This was the clean room, a sanitized, windowless and perfectly sealed room. There was no exit except for the door she had come in by. Bullets rained in. She dove behind a desk. The Terminator ran down the hall towards the gunfire, but hesitated by the bank of video monitors. One was trained on Sarah in the clean room. The Terminator instantly calculated her situation and location. He abruptly turned and strode back the way he came. In the clean room, Sarah was crawling into a corner, but it didn't do any good. The bullets were tearing past, missing by mere inches. Suddenly, the wall behind her burst open and the Terminator reached in, grabbed her by her collar and yanked her into the hall. Bullets blasted into the walls behind them as they raced forward and around the corner. John met them and they ran on together through the security checkpoint.